Norma, and then she'll send you the digital tickets um, through the interwebs or something like that, whatever we call today's world of technology. You won't get a paper ticket, is what I'm trying to say, correct? Well, well, well for baseball. Baseball. Oh, baseball is still far behind in the traditional list of the sports world, so you will get a paper ticket for them still, I guess. But soccer is well advanced in, in the digital world, so, uh, football, sorry. Um, all right, so we're going to start off with a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump straight in. John chapter 20 uh, is where we're headed today. John chapter 20. The Lord, we're so grateful for the opportunity to gather, to hang out, um, and to just uh, learn more about you. Um, we ask Lord, that your spirit would just lead and guide and direct us today in our conversation. Um, Lord, that you would be with Bobby in the conversation that he's having um, at camp there with those individuals, God, that you would minister through him as well. As, um, thank you that he gets to be a blessing to another body of believers. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you would sanctify our week this week. And uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Everybody have a good week. School is officially done. I'm assuming for everybody now, uh, parents are like, no. I know I was. Uh, man, the, the difference in perspective as you get older is wild. Um, and I guess you guys know this. Young people that are in the room, if you're youth age, uh, your parents love you, but man, it's complicated. It's a complicated love, right? Uh, and so uh, just, just FYI, give them some grace, all right? They know what you're going through because they were in your shoes, but you don't know what they're going through because you haven't been in their shoes yet. And so that's a big situation to think about. Uh, be careful what you say to your parents. It comes back at you tenfold. Ask my nine-year-old. So uh, it's a fun week for us as well. Nobody wants to do anything. It's amazing. Uh, I don't want to comes up a lot in our house. Uh, anyway, so John chapter 20. We've been traveling through the book of John. I am super excited. Uh, Bobby's going to wrap up John uh, uh, next week and then maybe do a couple weeks of review. Then we're headed into a new series for July and August that I'm stoked about. It's, uh, it's taking a look at uh, Old Testament and, and, and who Christ is, the symbolisms in the Old Testament, and then looking at who he is in the New Testament through it. So we realized we did the whole book of John. Uh, I felt like we did it too fast. Like, there's so much to dive into each chapter, uh, but I think we did it in like 30 weeks, so we still were there a long time. Um, it just felt like we went too fast um, if you're in each chapter going through it. So, um, but I, I'm really excited because what we're going to do with the, the comparisons there of Jesus um, is going to take a week in the Old Testament and then a week in the New Testament. A week in the Old Testament and a week in the New Testament. How we brought up last week about the Passover meal and how much symbolism is in there with Christ and what he did on the cross. And we just we when you're going through a book like John, and if you're not taking time in the week to really process through each thing uh, in each section on your own, you're never going to get everything. We were sitting back here on Wednesday, Wednesday morning coffee with, uh, oh, I guess it would have been, for me it would have been Wednesday lunch with Bobby, and we're talking about how many notes he had last week that he didn't even get to. He's like, I think I cut out three pages of notes on the on the crucifixion. There's just so much. Biblical saturation in these chapters, and we're just, we're not going to do them justice. You have got to take what we're talking about and dive into it in your personal studies, because um, I get to spend, for, in my case, I get to spend like a month thinking about what I'm talking about. I know it doesn't show. Bobby gets like a week, and so he still develops a lot of stuff, but you get saturated with these stories, and, and you just, you can't like... I watched my last sermon, and it was a train wreck, y'all. Why didn't somebody tell me? Like, at the end, I, I don't even know what I said at the end. I got so so caught off guard with the time. It was terrible. I love the fact that the TV's up there, and I have a time now, so I can watch my clock. Uh, but you guys can tell me when it's terrible. I'm okay. I'm a big boy. Uh, but it was bad last two, three weeks ago. I don't know how long it was. Anyway, this week's going to be better, because I can watch the clock, I swear. Um, I can pace myself a bit. So, John chapter 20, we're actually going to start at the end. Verse 30 and 31, and Bobby, Bobby brought this up last week. Verse 30 in John chapter 20 says this, it says, Jesus performed many signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, why were these written? That you may believe. Believe what? Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. This whole book was written for that purpose and for this reason. 
was that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. That is the entirety of why John is writing what he's writing. So in John chapter 20, when you look at that, if that's the point that we believe, keep that in your mind as we jump into this chapter now. Because he's writing these, I'll call them three uh, scenarios or three conversations, so that we may believe. And in each one, he's targeting somebody that they may believe. And we'll see the conversations that begin to happen. So John chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we, don't know, we do not know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started running from the, to the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in. So he looks into the tomb. But he doesn't go in, and he sees the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him, busts through the door, goes straight into the tomb, sees the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around his head, Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linens. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first goes inside. He saw, and what? Believed. He saw him believe. They still didn't understand from Scripture what exactly had happened, that Jesus had risen from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So this is the first scenario that we have of, of the resurrection. Jesus is coming out of the tomb, and, and we have this opening scenario. Now, John doesn't give us a ton of detail. The other Gospels actually go into a lot more detail of what kind of happens in this garden scenario. But John is specifically trying to get us to what? Believe. Believe. So he is targeting certain situations and certain um, pieces of information to help us in our unbelief. One of the big things, and John doesn't talk about this, but one of the big things that the, the Roman soldiers who were watching the tomb, they fell as dead men, and then they leave, they run away because they're scared because they totally messed up and have a death sentence on their lives now. They go before the priest and say, hey, we messed up, he's not there, he's gone. And the priests say, hey, tell them that the body was stolen, that his disciples gave us the body. So that's not recorded here in John. But John's giving us information to say that, hey, that's not the case. Look at what he says. He says, when you walk in, they were neatly, the, the, the linen cloths were neatly laid out and folded. I don't know if you've ever seen a robbery, but there's nothing neat and laid out and folded about a robbery, right? So if the linen cloths were there, how do you get a body out of it? Because these things are basically mummified. We, Bobby brought it up uh, in chapter 19 last week that there was 75 pounds, which is a lot, of, of spices that were packed. And then they do it tight and almost become like a, not quite pure mummification like the Egyptians, but it would become this hard casing. And yet that remained perfectly there, but the body was out. Not only that, the face cloth that was put over it was folded and neatly placed next to it. So John is in his evidence is clearly stating, like, look, nobody stole the body. We still have these linens that are laying there. Nobody came in and ransacked. Not only that, there was a full, and John is up, there's a full guard sitting there watching the tomb. And they all survived. If you're going to rob a tomb, you're not leaving, you know, any evidence of that, right? You don't want to just take the guys that can say, oh, we got robbed. No, you get rid of them, right? So, there's just so much of these stories that doesn't make any sense. Um, if you believe the lies that the uh, chief priests and Pharisees were trying to spew. So he says he arranged it, that the, the linens weren't moved and they weren't all tore up, but that they sat there and they were, it was perfect. As if he had just, oof, risen from the dead. And then something else that's very fascinating about this is that um, the tomb was, was empty before Jesus goes into it, it says. So this was a new tomb. And so you have a brand new tomb that was sealed up. They couldn't have mistaken his body was somewhere else. They didn't look at the wrong section of the tomb. Does that make sense? Like, there wasn't like 50 bodies, and they just happened to go to the wrong shelf. Oh, look, this one's empty. He's gone. This was a new tomb. 
There was no mistaking, and uh, 50 would have been a big one, but usually there was three or four people buried in a tomb uh, this time. So he wasn't mistaken, missing. Like he was gone. The evidence is clear. I'm, I'm bringing this up because John believes because of the evidence. It says that John looked into the tomb and saw, and he believed. Now, it says that he doesn't, that clearly he didn't understand the resurrection yet, but what, so what did he believe? What did verse 31 say he believed? Why is this written? So that we believe Jesus is what? The Messiah. The Messiah. So John might not fully comprehend the resurrection yet, but he fully understands that Jesus is the Messiah. He now gets it. It clicks for him. John looks at the evidence and says, you know what? Jesus is who he says he was. There's a, fan there's a couple of fantastic quotes. I have a couple copies out there um, on, the, on the shelf. Uh, but this one is called More Than a Carpenter. And it's a short read. I do short books, okay? ADHD. So, uh, this thing, you can read it in like a day. It's awesome. This is More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell also wrote the non-ADHD version of this called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And it's about this big and about that big. And it's evidence that demands a verdict stating who Christ says he is. Here's the awesome part. Josh McDowell started off his research trying to prove that we are insane for what we believe. And as he began to process through the evidence and through the story, he comes to a very clear conclusion that no, Christ is who he says he is. If you get a chance to read this book, please grab it, order on Amazon, it's a cheap read. If you, if you really, really can't read it, just read chapter three. If you can't read it all, call me, I will read it to you. Uh, chapter 3 is amazing, okay? So as a young person uh, in school, um, chapter 3 changed the way I perceive a philosophical argument for who God is. It's a fantastic discussion. Chapter 3, More Than a Carpenter, Josh McDowell, and I don't even get royalties. So, uh, great book. If you get a chance to pick it up on the uh, So he believes, John believes because of the evidence. Here's an interesting concept about the resurrection and the crucifixion. John says he wrote this uh, email in the lead. The crucifixion was very public. Very public. You had the entire nation, well, not the entire nation, but close. You had Passover, so you had a lot of people. Not only was it Passover, it was the high Sabbath before the Passover which we can get a whole bunch of conversations about that. But basically, it's like double Passover. So it's like the leap year of Passovers. So there was like more people than usual, right? It was a big deal. The Passover that Christ um, uh, is crucified. So you have these throngs of people, this public humiliation, stripped naked, beaten, and crucified. Big deal. If I was planning this story, I would not have had the death that way. I would have had the death the quiet, like, he slipped off peace and read and fell asleep. Tristan. What would have I had public? The resurrection. I would have had. Am I wrong? Like, if Blake Kaufman is planning this, the death is kind of the least public part of this that I want to go through. I want everybody to know I am me. And I'm like, there's like this, I'm serious. I've been thinking about this way too long, right? Like, I would have made a huge deal. Think about his birth. What does he do at his birth? He, like, lights up the sky. Right? He's got kings coming from who knows how far to bow and worship. He does it for the birth. And then there's this public humiliation at the death. And the resurrection gets no press time. That's fake news, people. Right? Like, where's the press on that one? Jesus has rose from the dead, and it's quiet. It's relational. He does it so intimate, the resurrection. So intimate. But he doesn't first reveal himself to Peter and John. Peter, James, and John are the big three of the disciples. That's not the first person he publicly appears to. For the first public appearance, 
We actually have to keep reading. John chapter 20, verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. So Mary goes to the tomb early, sees the body's not there, or that the tomb is empty and the stone drove away, runs back, tells the disciples, uh, comes back with the disciples. The disciples see what's going on. They leave. Mary's still hanging around the garden. Mary's still processing what's, what is going on. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she sees two angels in one, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? So listen to what she says. They have taken the body. I, I'm guessing Peter or John, I, they leave thinking, Oh my gosh, they stole the body. Can you believe this? I mean, what are we going to do now? And they just leave. Mary's like, they stole the body. She's still, she's still processing. What does that mean? And I don't know where they put it. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing behind her, and she said she didn't realize it was Jesus. Verse 15. He, Jesus, asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you put him, and I will go get him. Jesus then turned to her and said, or Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Don't hold on to me yet, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary runs to the disciples, tells them the news, and says, I have seen the Lord. Not only that, she then tells them all these things that happened to her while she was in the garden. This is an incredible story as well. Once again, John is recording it. Why? So that we may believe. It doesn't make sense that the resurrection isn't a public ordeal. It really doesn't to me. I want the bells and the whistles and the trumpets and the lights. I want that for Jesus on the resurrection Sunday morning. That's what I envision. It doesn't make sense that it doesn't make sense. Here's another thing that doesn't make sense. The first person he appears to is a woman. Now, don't get offended. But in a court of law, back then, a woman's testimony didn't even count. So, to first reveal himself to a woman who then has to go tell the disciples what she's seen doesn't make sense either. So, like, why? That's, that's backwards. Go to the chief priest and be like, hey, dummy, I'm here. Right? Go to the guy who controls the masses of religion and just say, it's me, you messed up. No, he goes to a woman who's weeping, who's heartbroken. And he sits in that moment. Her story means nothing in a court of law. Her word is the worst possible testimony. In fact, a... Um, an early second, second century scholar who was a, uh, uh, oh my goodness, I forgot the word, somebody who would write against Christianity, think they were, what's that called, but, um, one of his big things that he stated was that I will never believe the hysterical testimony of a woman. Now, he literally wrote it saying, if she's the one that told the story first, couldn't have. It makes no sense. They're crazy, right? So, so why, would, why would we believe her story? Why would he believe that there was a group of women that went to the tomb and he revealed it? That, that doesn't make sense. And, and the crazy part is, if I was writing the story, that's not the way I would have done it either. It doesn't make sense in that cultural context. But yet, for some reason, Lake Kaufman's not writing the story. <laughs> Thank God, right? There's somebody who's writing the story that has a plan and an understanding far above mine. Which that doesn't really, it's very hard to get far above my understanding. But So the other disciple believed because of the evidence. The, uh, Mary believes because of the word. She says, he says Mary. And as soon as Jesus says Mary, the lights turn on and boom, she believes. She understands. Think about, think about this, that, that there's two angels, which I, I guess I don't think she realized they were angels, right? So where did you take them? Then there's Jesus, who she doesn't realize is Jesus, the gardener. 
She is in such a broken mindset. She is so sad. And all it takes is one word from Jesus. Mary. Who? Our eyes are open. The word, the testimony of Jesus, instantly can change our lives. Scripture very clearly states that Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God in John chapter 1. And we talked about that. Jesus is our revelation. He helps us believe in the calling of our apostles. He writes this down. John is recording this story so that we might believe. Some believe because of the evidence. Some believe because of the Bible, sitting there reading about who Christ is in our lives. There's a really cool scenario about this as well. It says that one of the angels was sitting at the head and the other one was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Talking about that Old Testament symbolism, when you look at the, the Ark of the Covenant that Moses, uh, that they made when they were coming out of uh, Egypt, it says that there was two angels sitting, one at the head and one at the foot, facing each other. That's really cool. That's the Holy of Holies where the presence of God dwells. I think it's just another one of John's writings, a little thing that he slips in there to say, look, the angels are back resting at the head and the feet of the presence of God. Man, that is so cool. That is awesome to think about, that in the empty tomb, still the presence of God was being symbolized. I love that little side note of, uh, of information. Next segment, and the one I'm trying to get to, is John chapter 20, 19 through 29, the story of Thomas. So 19 through 29 says this. On the evening of the first day, so Jesus rose from the dead, he has appeared to Mary. We know that according to Luke's account, he's appeared to Peter. We're not sure when, but he appeared to Peter. But we also know he's appeared to the road to Emmaus. To Emmaus. Emmaus. And so he's appeared to a couple people at this point, and they've all come back to the disciples and shared their story. So within that, they're now gathered, first day of the week, still the same day, in the evening. When the disciples came together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes for the last three days. I know, I know we can't do that, but um, emotionally, put yourselves in their shoes. The guy that you had invested your life and gave up your future for died, and you don't get to play yet. But these guys gave up fishing, these guys gave up being a tax collector, which was a decent paying job at the time because you're stealing a lot of money. Um, they were giving up all these things that were, were good and, and, and seemed like great life choices. And they gave them all up for three years. And you know what? The dude ended up dead. You sit in that. You have a Sabbath. You have this time where you're supposed to be gathering and, and celebrating. Then you have Passover. And it's after all that. It's the first day of the week. You walk in and crazy lady comes in and says he's gone. And then all of a sudden the disciples come back and say he's gone. Then all of a sudden the lady comes back and says I've seen him. This is what he said. And then Peter says this. and then the road to the man's guys come back and say he's alive, he's alive. But yet you also have the same story being told from the Jewish people that we brought up that says they stole his body. So they are locked away, hidden in a room out of fear. It's not in confusion and chaos. I don't think they're in a great mental space right now, is what I'm trying to say. They are in the chaos, and they have no idea what is going on. They're not connecting the dots yet. And they are scared, people. Doors locked, scared. Because first of all, it was very against the religious times to go touch a dead body, let alone steal a dead body. The Roman guards have at this point said that they were, you know, fell asleep and, and took it, so Rome's kind of after them, because the soldiers are trying to get rid of the evidence too. 
They're scared out of their minds. They're in, in, in just fear, chaos, but yet con 